Well, we're up to part 38 of our Messiah devotionals, and we're still in the book of Revelation, looking at the different titles of Jesus and the um, parts of Revelation that are pointing to him and extolling him, drawing attention to him. And uh, we're up to Revelation 19, verse 16, and the title of this one is Messiah, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it says, On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And uh, it, is a, it is always a great thing, isn't it, to see um, people honoured with um, titles or with recognition for something that they've done, either to benefit uh, their fellow man or some exploit, something they've done that is worthy of praise, worthy of commendation, worthy of um, a title. And uh, I just think at the time of recording this <coughs> and the coronavirus, we've um, seen, bless his heart, we've seen Captain Tom do laps of his garden, raising huge amounts of money for the NHS. And uh, he's been honoured. Now, Sir Tom, I mean, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? And let's see all these birthday cards that were sent to him, just thousands and thousands of people honouring him. Uh, for something that he's done in uh, that he could do to bless and look and and um, take care of people it's a wonderful thing we also know that in the world there are many people who give themselves titles and draw attention to themselves and say how wonderful they are and how much they should be honored and that that kind of doesn't quite sit so comfortably with us because we think well you're just saying that about yourself but in this, in this um, instance, we're finding someone who's honoured. We're finding someone, it says here, with a, with a garment on, um, uh, on his robe and on his thigh. There is this name that's written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So it's um, not something that's inappropriate for Jesus to be wearing. He's got it on his garment. He's got it tattooed on his thigh. It's on his very person. And we notice that this garment he's wearing is also um, dipped in blood so this isn't like a pristine costume that he's just got off the shelf somewhere to make himself look as if he's done something that he hasn't really done now this this these are garments that are, are not being worn without cost these garments have seen battle and there's there's blood on them and it's his own blood and figuratively it's the blood of his enemies uh, defeating death and sin and evil and this is this is someone who's who's uh, alive even though he's stained with blood and it shows that he's been successful it shows that he's been through battle but he's alive he's he's come through the battle and he's he's won and we also find in this little passage that there's there's three names that are particularly given to Jesus here in verse 12 we says it says uh, his eyes are like a flame of fire on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that no one knows but himself now that figuratively means that there's something between him and the father that is purely um, exclusive to them it denotes the power uh, and the exclusivity of the Godhead, it, it, it denotes Jesus as being one with the Father. It's a name that only God knows. It's, it's, it's reserved uh, for only God's counsel within himself. So there's that name. Then we find in verse 13, as we've, uh, uh, we've heard in other places in the New Testament, he's clothed, enrobed, dipped with blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And that kind of <coughs> implies uh, a mystery, a kind of a, a transcendence, an otherness, that although he came as a man, clothed himself with humanity, he is the word. There's, he's the full representation of God's being in himself. And um, we find that in Philippians 2 verse 9, uh, it talks about him being given the name above every other name. Because of his obedience to death, he's exalted with the name above every other name so there's something here in the word of god there's something that inspires awe and reverence worship a bended knee a humility from us as, as human beings in a world that's full of so many opinions and voices um, the appropriate response to be before the word of god incarnate is a silence 
it's good for man sometimes to be silent and to bow before the presence of one who is so much more than we are. And I think at the moment the world is so full of noise, so full of human voices, um, sometimes saying good things, sometimes saying not so good things. There does come a point within the life of every man and woman when we have to look up at this one who is the word of God, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and every mouth be silent. I do wonder whether sometimes we would be good to sort of ask God to give us that kind of sense of his presence so that we, we find ourselves silent before him. Um, not out of cringing fear, but just out of beautiful, reverent submission to the one who really is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's amazing. And it says there in that verse we were looking at, it says on, it's not just on his garment, that it, it's, um, uh, it's on his robe and on his thigh he has the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So uh, the fact that it's written on his thigh, that signifies um, power. Uh, in Psalm 45 verse 3 it says, Gird your sword on your side. Uh, on your thigh, uh, mighty one. There's there's something that's where the sword goes. That's where your sword is strapped if you're a warrior. So the name on his thigh, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, it's where power, uh, authority uh, is signified as resting. That's where the sword would be. Um, now you might say, well, if he's this powerful king, why doesn't he strike down all his enemies now when the new testament says he must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet well if he's already won the victory why doesn't he do that well i suppose a, a, i don't know if this is a helpful image or not but perhaps just to help um see the there's something glorious about seeing a victory won so if you're watching a film and there's good and bad in it there's right and wrong uh, there's righteousness and evil in it. If if the if the enemies, if the evil, if the 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 darkness that needs to be overcome, in the first five minutes of the film said, "All right, we give up, we surrender," it would not only be a very short film, but it wouldn't it wouldn't it wouldn't draw attention to the might of that which is right. It wouldn't fully exalt the rightness of the cause or the power of the victor who has righteousness on their side. And there's something actually glorious about seeing Jesus overcome his enemies through the course of history. And there's partly because God is, it says that God doesn't want any to perish, so he's patient, he restrains the day of judgment because he wants everyone to come to know Christ. But there's also something about us seeing Jesus go from victory to victory it's a bit like when Moses confronted Pharaoh and Pharaoh resisted and his heart his heart got hard and he opposed God he opposed God and there's this great long protracted tussle between will God's people be set free or not and this 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 narrative develops and then finally Pharaoh and his horsemen are drowned in the Red Sea now the victory is magnified because of the battle that there was to get through to the place of victory. And I think as, as believers, we need to understand that when we see the battle going on in the world at the moment for, for, the, for the gospel to gain the hearts of men and women, this King of Kings, it's not, it's not because he doesn't have the power. It's because there's something glorious about watching him go from victory unto victory, reigning until he's put all his enemies under his feet and also it would be true to say that it's not like God is fighting against evil and it will he win won't he win no this this king of kings and lord of lords he's sovereign over all things he's sovereign over all things only evil is restrained even now if if evil were not restrained then um the world would be far worse than it is it's a bit like if water um, wasn't kept in a room uh, of, uh, you know, above freezing, it would become ice. Or so the world, if it were not kept in the warmth, if you like, of God's providential mercy and kindness, the ice of evil would, 
completely overcome the world. But there is the heat of God's presence, his providence, his common grace in the world that keeps the world from being as bad as it could be if evil were allowed to go unrestrained and unchecked. So it's important we understand God isn't like trying to win. He has all things under his feet and he's working out his purposes so that his victory is seen to be a full and complete and magnified victory in the way that much as you, even going through the handles at Handel's Messiah, it lasts about three hours, I think, the whole performance. If it was just like one piece, you know, God good, devil bad, God wins, the end. It's a very small, short piece. But actually going through the whole oratio, as it's called, going through the whole three-hour performance magnifies the sense of building and building and building a victory. And even in our own lives, we can see the hand of God in our lives where we go through personal battle, we prove God in times of difficulty, we see him again and again being faithful, kind, merciful, a deliverer, we see his goodness when we face things, well, what are we going to do? God comes through again and again and again. We build a lifetime of proving his victory, which gives us more to worship him for, because rather than just, you know, we come to Christ and go to glory straight away. No, there's a lifetime of seeing his victory worked out in our lives, proving him, proving him through the ups and downs and the difficulties and the battles. Because we know that he's battled and won for us, so we go through, we're in him. So his victory is our, our victory. So we're not at the mercy of evil. We're in the train, we're in the, the, the slipstream of one who has defeated everything. Nothing can touch us unless the Lord permit it and if he does permit it it is always that we would go from one victory to the other proving his goodness and his kindness. So what does that mean for us? Well it means we must be confident as believers if you're a believer this morning you must be confident if God is for us who can be against us? This is the question scripture poses. If this King of Kings and Lord of Lords who knows no, no defeat if he is for us, if he's on our side, goodness, what a thought, then who can be against us? Shall death, shall trouble, shall famine, shall nakedness, shall peril, shall sword? No, in all these things we're more than conquerors, is what the Bible says. So we need to retain our confidence in God, even in the midst of the moment. You know, coronavirus, our mortality gets a bit threatened. We think, goodness, what if we, what if we catch this and die? Or... There's all sort of turmoil in the world. We think, goodness, how is the world going to pan out? It all seems so scary. Well, we tuck ourselves confidently under the shadow of his wings, this great warrior king. And it's about being humble, uh, deeply humble before Jesus. I, I, I do think the one thing that should mark us as believers is a great humility before God and, and um, our opinions, our words, our confident assertions about things need to be tempered with a, with a great humility. Humility is a, is, a, is a wonderful thing that God loves. He said he gives grace to the humble and I think it would do us good to have a have a sort of a discipline of gen genuinely recognising who we are without who we would be without him, what he's done for us. It's not to make us feel bad about ourselves, it's just to give us a sense of reality. This king has won a battle for us we'd never win for ourselves. It humbles us, fills us with thankfulness. And also we should rejoice that the king is, your, is our friend. I mean, wow, that he calls us friends. He's made us sons and daughters of the king. And that causes us to, to rejoice. And, and lastly, just to say, if you're not a believer, or you're not a, you've not received Christ, you've not yielded yet to this King of Kings, and you've not, as it were, surrendered your sword to him and say, I, I give you my life. Well, he, he is the one who died on the cross for you. That's the blood on his garments. He, he fought your biggest enemies. He defeated your biggest enemies. He went into battle for you, not for himself. He didn't need to fight for himself. Nothing to prove, nothing to win. He's already the king of kings. 
He went into battle for you so that you might be delivered from your enemies, death and sin. Death which is inevitable for all of us and sin which grips our lives and makes us not the people we know we should be. Living alien from God and doing, saying, thinking things for which we feel guilty and the reason we feel guilty is because we are guilty. We need a deliverer. We need a warrior to fight for us. And Jesus did that for you and for me. So it is right that we surrender to the one who gave his life to us before we even acknowledged him. While we were still sinners, it says in the Bible, Christ died for us. While we didn't, we didn't give him a thought, we didn't care about him, he still battled for us while we didn't give him a thought. What a king, what a friend, what a what a lord. This, you can understand people fighting for their own people, but he fought for people who didn't want him in order that they might have their eyes open and see him for who he is and see the truth for what it is. What a gracious, kind king we have. So let's leave, uh, leave us with that thought um, today, that he's the king of kings and lord of lords. See you next time.